Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. You realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world. Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. Okay, this is uh, VK7 uh, OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our DATV Experimenters Night. And it's a wild and windy night up here on the Queen's Domain. We've got a few people out in the uh, who braved coming out uh, tonight. But, uh, we've got a very full, um, very full program tonight. <laughs> so uh, we'll get uh, straight into it. Just reminding people that they can uh, call in on the, uh, the YouTube streaming channel uh, if they want to ask questions or uh, make comments about the uh, presentation throughout it, I'll keep an eye on that. Uh, and also, uh, I'm listening on uh, repeater two. Uh, although I'm not sure I can, I can, I might not be able to come back to you because I think the batteries may be uh, a little bit flat in this uh, this particular handheld. But uh, we'll try. Yeah, so you can call in on both those channels. So um, tonight uh, we'll start off uh, first of all with. Uh, I had a, a parcel arrive uh, in the uh, in the mail uh, during the week. Um, I I am I am an owner of uh, like a, a number of people I think an owner of uh, a couple of gas powered so butane powered uh, soldering irons, which I have um, I have a bit of. Uh, a bit of a mixed review about gas-powered um, soldering irons. Anyone who's played with them, they are very, uh, they can be very temperamental. Um, and so when um, when uh, this particular uh, option came up, which is a um, uh, a battery-powered, <laughs> it's got lithium-ion batteries uh, in it, uh, and uh, it's a um, a battery-powered. Um, uh, soldering iron. Let me just go to the close-up camera. Uh, that's as wide as we go. So um, this is the the very nice kit it comes in. Um, uh, they are currently on special at Ultronics. So uh, I'll I'll do a bit of a plug. They uh, are currently on special. Um, this is the soldering iron. We'll go into that in a minute. There's a cover um, and a couple of different tips, and I'll go into those. Uh, cleaning uh, brass. Uh, there's a roll of uh, lead-free solder that comes with it, as well as the uh, the USB charging cable that uh, that comes with it. The actual soldering iron, and I'll uh, this is the the heart of it. Um, the actual soldering iron itself, um, you can see uh, very nice. It's got a, um, a a little safety ledge here, so it sits 
uh, with a uh, when that's hot uh, keeps it uh, away from things which is really good there's a bit of a safety interlock um, there uh, like it is uh, with it in the off position uh, you, this button doesn't do anything in the on position um, it doesn't do anything until you push the button and you'll see there is a little uh, LED light that lights up on it which also tells you that this tip is going to be getting quite uh, quite hot and that gets to solder temperature so we're talking you know over over probably 280 degrees C at that tip uh, within eight seconds so and I have a, uh, a burn on my finger to prove that <laughs> so um, <laughs> Um, so it heats up really, really quickly, uh, eight seconds, and you've got a uh, basically a soldering iron, a 30 watt soldering iron that you can actually solder with. Um, uh, the the charging of the soldering iron, there's a USB micro USB uh, port in this end. There is also on the side a uh, a blue uh, a blue a um, uh, a red green LED. So red, uh, it's charging. Green, it's uh, fully charged. Um, it doesn't take that long to actually charge uh, and according to the instructions that charge lasts for about 30 to 40 hours of soldering time. Uh, now I haven't actually soldered for 30 to 40 hours to actually prove that but that's a pretty impressive amount of time and if they're lithium ion batteries, perfect, um, if you think about it, it's a perfect application for lithium ion batteries. Have you turned it up? Yep. Huh. Let me just, uh, I just had a report that the audio is quite low, so I'll, I'll just provide a little bit more. So uh, see how that goes, Murray. <laughs> um, so um, so that's, the, uh, that's the soldering iron. It does come with a couple of other tips. Um, one is a element tip. Uh, if I zoom in on that, uh, you can see there is a bit like a cigarette lighter. Um, there is a, uh, a coil in the... Um, coil in the uh, the end of that that gets uh, red hot um, and there's another tip that comes with it uh, which is a hot knife tip um, and you can see that's actually quite a, a sharp end on that so you, you don't want to get too close to that and that gets um, that gets be hot so uh, for uh, carving through things uh, like a well a hot knife through butter really um, that's the uh, that's the tip uh, the other tip that comes with it so these are you can see um, they have the uh, the connections in here the element is actually in the uh, in the the body of the uh, the um, the tip in fact I'll, uh, I'll I'll just I'll show you this particular tip that tips cooled down let's screw this tip on and I'll just show you um, this is uh, and we'll do a focus it's okay I'm on and there we go so that gets pretty hot pretty uh, pretty quick uh, probably good for uh, um, uh, things like heat shrink uh, and where you need a bit of uh, localized uh, localized heat um, but that's the uh, that's that tip um, and the cover um, very nice little cover um, the, the cover's actually quite nicely designed because if I, if I zoom out a little bit here, when you put the uh, the cover on, if the soldering iron is still on, it switches the soldering iron off <laughs> through a little lip here and also covers up the hot bit um, and I assume that is heat resistant plastic so uh, that's actually quite nice. Um, so. That's um, the Iroda um, Pro 25 LK uh, soldering iron, uh, 25L uh, LK. Comes with the instructions um, uh, and uh, all of the bits that you can start soldering basically from uh, the time you open the box. So uh, that's actually not uh, not bad. Um, and very easy you can get replacement tips uh, this is a, a um, fairly well-known company um, out of I think Europe um, that uh, produces all things uh, hot and fiery <laughs> uh, so uh, so yeah uh, that's and, and I have I have used it um, I haven't used it outside though yet which I uh, if there's a little bit of wind that used to be the uh, the um, uh, 
the enemy of uh, gas-fired butane soldering irons. But anyway, I rode it currently on special at uh, Alltronics. Uh, well worth a bit of a look in. Now, a um, bit of a reminder. Um, oh, today and tomorrow, um, uh, from... Now, let me get this right. From 0935 UTC uh, through to 1550 uh, tomorrow, so June the 10th, the ISS is transmitting slow scan TV images on 145800, so the standard voice channel uh, on the 9th and 10th. Um, they're part of the Moscow Aviation Institute SSTV experiment, which is MAI 75, and will be made from RS0 ISS uh, in the Russian service module using uh, the Kenwood TM D710 uh, transceiver. So that is, and there are a number of reasonable passes. Uh, I did a bit of a, uh, a bit of a Google uh, on um, uh, the passes of the ISS. You can get that from amsat.org uh, forward slash track. Uh, and you can see the uh, you put in your grid square, and it comes up with the next uh, the next ten passes. Uh, so there are some decent passes over the next couple of days. So if you're into receiving slow scan TV, uh, ISS over the next uh, day um, is uh, transmitting um, pictures. So uh, well worth a bit of a look with your slow scan TV. Um, slow scan TV uh, program of choice and good evening David uh, I saw David on his way home puffing uh, on his bike so we're doing very well uh, in the uh, in the rain and sleet so uh, good stuff David um, uh, yes <laughs> the hat this is the best use for a, um, a rabbit I'll just say that um, uh, other than uh, the yeah than uh, probably rabbit pie um, <laughs> this this comes from uh, comes from the states, so uh, and you can fold down. You can do it's a real one. You can fold down, and I can't hear a thing. Uh, and you can also fold down the front and the back. So um, uh, it is a very nice and very warm hat. So I do get some funny looks in the um, uh, in the actual uh, when I'm driving in the car with it though. Uh, <laughs> now another update. Um, we featured the DigiRig interface uh, a few. DATV nights ago, Dennis Kresak, uh, K0TX, uh, let a select group of people know uh, that there are a number of updates. He has revision 1.5 about to be released uh, to the market. The differences with revision 1.5 for the DigiRig uh, interface is USB-C uh, is being used on the computer side of the interface now. So it is not uh, a USB, a standard USB. It is now a USB-C type connector on the uh, the computer side of the interface, and there are some optional switches um, inside. So these are uh, solder bridge type switches inside um, the interface that enables you to configure what the two hardware lines do. So is it uh, push to talk and or CW? Um, the CAT function selector pads are on the back of the PCB clearly labelled and you can just bridge them with a, a little bit of solder. So uh, there are some uh, some options that now are now available on the revision 1.5. Um, now I don't know uh, I don't know what the cost whether there's any additional cost or what it is, but um, about to be released uh, from the DigiRig site. So uh, so there you go. Um, now. We have our um, GNU Radio workshop number four. Now, GNU Radio. Okay, um, this is this is. I, I, I described the the kit here. Um, the kit is. Um, it, it's a toolkit of of digital signal processing. Um, that you can actually uh, do a whole lot of things with, including a whole bucket load of RF uh, type processing. It is a, an incredibly deep and dense toolkit 
um, and I think this might put a lot of people off because they take one look at the toolkit and go oh my god this does absolutely everything and you've got to configure everything and you've got to you know got to know what this button does and this this output does and what a sink and a source is and all sorts of things it's what I've been trying to do over the last couple of weeks and workshops is just give you a, a few hints and tips and ideas about what different things mean uh, and so you can at least start off and start to do some of the some of the things and tests and um, experiments that you can with with um, with this freeware um, this freeware uh, uh, toolkit um, uh, GNU Radio Companion. So so just to recap what we did uh, in our last workshop, so a bit of reinforcement. Um, what we'll do, we'll go to um, one I prepared earlier. Um, so, what we've got here, um, this is exercise number three uh, that we went into. Um, to do a little bit of recap from last week, um, from the last, sorry, not last week, the week before, if you uh, click in this module area, which are all of the modules available in uh, GNU Radio Companion, and you do a Control F, it actually gives you a find function. So uh, if you know that it's got source in the, um, and you spell it right, uh, source in the, in, the, um, in the title, you can put in source and it gives you all of the things that have got source in the title. So it just makes it a little bit easier to um, multiplier. Um, there we go, and, and it gives you all of the things that have got multiplier in the uh, in the in the in the title of the uh, the particular block. So, really handy little option. Um, all of the blocks have parameters and everything that are, is associated with them. Um, you can see uh, the um, this particular signal source block uh, that we've got here. What we be able, we we are be able to do is add some real time control to that particular block. We went through this last time. You notice in the frequency area here, we've got a little F, and if we go into this QuickTime GNU range, so GUI range, if we go into this particular block, and we go and open that particular block up, we'll notice that it's got the ID of F so this links those two blocks together through that variable F and you can set in this GUI range it goes between 0 and 10,000 in one steps in uh, single steps and we can link it in here and go you can see if frequency is F and all of these ones that are underlined that's another thing we learnt last time all of these things in here that are underlined are all able to be changed real time. So you can actually put one of these one of these uh, range variables against each one of these and control them all in real time. But in this case, all we're doing is controlling the frequency. So that's another thing we learnt. Um, there is, uh, if you hover over the these little coloured inputs and outputs you can and you press the up and down key you can change the type of the in this case the output and you'll notice that as I go through the little connector goes red and that means that you haven't actually matched this block and that block with the right type now how do you know what type there actually are up here in the help menu if you go to help and types then it gives you the color coding for the complex float the complex integer the float and the integer types and we went into those last time so the complex types uh, the key thing with the complex type is you get a single frequency response based on what what it's doing in this particular block if it's a real type or a float type then you get a positive and a negative response and you you then have to deal with a positive and a negative frequency and we went into negative frequencies last time so it's just a, a mathematical construct um, sometimes you need a throttle and what a throttle does if none of these blocks are externally clocked so if if they're 
if there's a, a particular input that has a clock associated with it, you don't need a throttle because it self-regulates, it self-throttles. But if you've got a whole lot of blocks in here that have no, uh, no internal clock associated with them, you probably, uh, it'll, it'll suggest when you do a compile that you probably need a throttle so that it doesn't overload the CPU in this particular machine. So, so, um, and it suggests it. And if you put a throttle in, and it's and um, when you do the compile, and it suggests that you don't actually need a throttle, it'll actually tell you and say you probably don't need the throttle in there. Now, in this particular case, for this for this flow graph, there are no external clocks in here, so we do need a throttle. Uh, it's at the sample rate, so this is a variable sample rate set at 32k so throughout anything that uses a sample rate in here you can just say sample underscore rate and it will make it make it what that variable is so you can you can flow that across a whole lot of blocks so this is this is the exercise three that we did it's got a bit of a signal source uh, we've got a bit of a control of the frequency of that signal source there's a bit of a throttle so it doesn't overload things we also have a noise source down here and, and the type of noise source is a Gaussian noise source and it's you set the amplitude here we add them together so mathematically add the signal source here and the noise source together and then we've got a frequency sync here which is a, a graphical user interface frequency sync so in this case think about it being a oscilloscope so if we run this we run it up here and we find that we've got a here we go uh, we've got this is our oscilloscope you notice that there is a positive and a negative frequency here <laughs> so and we've also got this Gaussian noise so the Gaussian noise just means it is noise across the whole spectrum so it's um, pseudo random noise uh, across the whole spectrum and then you've got a little bit of a peak here which is the frequency source and that's showing on the chart as a, a much a much higher signal and you'll notice up here you've got this is your the graphical user interface range and you can change this and you can see it's going up and guess what the frequency peak is following what I'm actually doing here it goes all the way down to zero I haven't set it up so that it can go negative you only go positive um, and you can go from zero to uh, 10 kilocycles so uh, that just moves it around but you can see that's the noise source and the signal source so we then introduced last week the the some of the filter blocks low pass filter we introduced a low pass filter we set it at a cutoff frequency of 5k and a transition width of 2k so let's put we put this into the noise source so it's filtering the noise source so what a low pass filter is it lets everything through below the cutoff frequency which in this case is 5k now just ignore we've still got a negative and a positive here just this is zero in the middle here and we go and we we can use this little frequency source just to go there is zero so that's in the middle and we go up, 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 up until it starts to fall off. And right about where it starts to fall off is about 5K, which is what we've set up the cutoff frequency for. So everything above 5K gets filtered out. And you can see it drops down to a really low level. So that's a low pass filter. If we go to the next exercise, we've got a high pass filter in the same position. And the high pass filter cutoff frequency is set at the same 5k. Now, looks inverted. <laughs> we do the same thing with our frequency source. If we go back to zero, there it is in the middle down here. And so this is this what it, what a high pass filter is, is it lets through everything above the cutoff frequency. So what's the cutoff frequency in this particular case? There's zero. Let's go all the way up until we just get to where it starts to come out of the noise. And that is about, surprise, surprise, about 5K. And that's what we've set the cutoff frequency. So everything above 5K in this case would go through the filter. Everything below the, the 5K will, will, is get, gets stopped through that 
high pass filter. Now, let's go to the next one. We've got a band pass filter. Now, a band pass filter is literally the combination of a high pass and a low pass filter. So, this looks funny. Uh, it looks a bit like a camel, I suppose, with two humps. Um, if we go do the same exercise down to zero, and you'll notice that's in the middle, we've got this band pass filter configured to be a low cutoff frequency of 2K and a high cutoff frequency of 5K with a transition width of 1K. So this it goes from a, it goes from one state to another pretty quick over at one kilohertz. At zero, we've got it right down low. As we come up, we suddenly get it go up and it goes up at about 2k which is what it's set to then if we keep going we'll find the other side of this hump and it's about 5k so what a bandpass filter does is let through everything between the low cutoff frequency and the high cutoff frequency so everything in here it lets through so that's a, a good example of a low pass, a high pass, and a band pass filter that's available in, in this exercise. So now, just I'll just refer to my notes here. Now, a few little hints in here. We've got a few examples in here around... Um, probably th This is probably a good example where we had our band pass filter. One of the things you've got to be very aware of um, when you do a flow graph, and uh, probably flow graphs that are reasonably complex have a lot of blocks in them all connected together, you've got to keep um, note and keep track of the sample rates all the way from the beginning to the end, so that from the source to the sink um, within a flow graph, and make sure that you are matching those sample rates or converting those sample rates as you go through um, to uh, to the right sample rate. And a good example of that is, um, this is a little bit of a single sideband example that one of the workshops um, we, um, we were working on. Um, and it starts off at the variable sample rate is set to 96K so the signal source is 96k um, this th there is a file source so I, I talked about this in an earlier session you can actually have an, a whole range of different sources and in fact the next one we're going to do has an rto sdr source a real one um, that we're going to be using as the source but in this particular case what this is is a audio file and this is actually a sampled audio file um, from a from a radio, it goes into a multiply block. Now, all, all a multiply block is, if you think about in radio terms, a mixer. Um, now, it's not a balanced mixer. It's just a mixer. It mixes two signals together. Just excuse me. I'm having a, uh, a, a drink here because I'm about to cough. Um, so think about the multiply as a mixer. So all that's doing is mixing a signal source and mixing a, uh, a, uh, a, an audio file here, you'll notice that the frequency in here is set at zero. So one of the things you can do when you, you build up a, 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 um, a flow graph is once you isolate a particular frequency that you're looking for in a flow graph, what you can do, and this is a technique that you can use in the flow graph is, you then frequency shift that that frequency to zero hertz and then you can start to do some processing on it like uh, decimation and a few other things and I'll go into that in a, in a, in a little while we, we, we touched on decimation last time but you can you can basically start uh, isolate that frequency get it to zero and then you can start to do some of the processing on that particular block so in this particular case, we're at 96K at this point. This, the, this, the, one of the outputs of here goes straight into what we call a multiply constant block. Now all that does is control what's coming through here. In this particular case, it's, it's a, uh, like a vector adding two vectors together. 
Uh, in this case, the constant that we're adding into this particular flow is 10K, and that goes off to a, a, a GUI frequency sync like we had before. So it's a, a, an oscillator type, uh, type uh, uh, output. On another of these outputs comes out, goes through a, a low pass filter set at about 1.5K, goes into another one of these mixer blocks and we, we've got coming in here at, at, into this mixer block another signal source but at 48k so this is at a different sample rate and the reason we're doing that is the output right at the end here is at what we call an audio sync so an audio sync you can think of as a speaker and in the case of the audio sync on this PC, it is the speaker. So it goes out to the audio card, to the sound card, and the sound card sample rate is 48K. So that's why this is at 48K. We're mixing that signal that's coming in here through that low pass filter with a cutoff at 1.5K. We're adding in another frequency source. So this could be. I, I suppose uh, um, this is what we refer to as the bandpass filter or the bandpass frequency um, goes into a, uh, uh, a conversion block that takes it from a complex type to a float type in through one of these these multiply constant and in this particular case this is the volume control we use this as a volume control we can change the, the volume through this multiply constant block and it goes out to the audio so I'll just run this just to show you. Now um, I've got a bit of an issue which I haven't worked. I hadn't worked out by the time I got here, but with the frequency display, the frequency display is not displaying, and I'm not quite sure why that is. But what's happening here is, um, and let me turn up the volume here. Uh, now that's correct, and. Now, why haven't we got some volume? What's this? Just bear with me. I don't reckon we're on the right. No, we're not. That's a bit better. So, we've got a volume control. Straight out volume control. That's one of these quick time GUI range ones here, which is what it's doing is changing this constant in here to the audio sync. Now we've got what sounds like a bit of duck talk in here. We've got the ability to change the tuning frequency, which is this block here. So change the frequency there. We've also got the ability to change the frequency for the pass band here so that we get it in into the pass band. We've got the ability to control it. So if we if we start changing the pass band. Okay, we've got a bit. Hang on, I'll turn it up for you. Okay, starting to get there. Okay, that's where there. There we go. <laughs> so so this little recording is an actual recording of, of someone doing QSOs, DX QSOs in America. But it just gives you the ability to play with what would normally be um, the frequency tune and also in this case you can change the band pass width um, of this particular uh, this particular receiver until you can actually and what this what this audio source block is doing it's set so that it just keeps repeating the audio source over and over again so it, it just gives you a bit of an idea of um, keeping number one keeping your sample rates to the right level for the particular um, particular application that you've got um, now decimation You'll notice that there are some decimation steps in here. The low pass filters all had decimation steps in them. All decimation means is you reduce the sample rate by a factor of, of n. Um, so uh, 
in in the case of um, digital signal processing, you don't actually need every sample to be able to recreate the the particular um, intelligence that's on that signal. You can actually get away with quite a bit less um, of those of samples, x number of samples. Um, so, uh, oh, hang on, we got uh, oh Richard. And Richard, good evening, Richard from Windy King Island. So uh, yeah, that's good because there's a uh, there's a wind farm on there. So that's excellent. Good evening, and great you could tune in. And he, yes, and David, he was uh, <laughs> he was on on Flinders last week, so he's getting around. Um, so uh, so yeah, and oh, David's uh, David's been off to Swan Flinders and Three Hummock. Well, there you go. Not done, King. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, so good evening, uh, good evening, Richard uh, and uh, and David. Uh, good to uh, good to hear you on. And by all means, leave um, leave comments on the uh, on the um, on the the streaming channel. Um, now, I so talking about decimation. So um, so you don't actually need all of the samples. And in fact, what this does, if you don't need all the samples, what it does is reduce the load, the processing and the computing load on the um, on the particular computer that you're doing this processing on. So it does have some advantages um, to uh, to decimate. However, one of the key things that you've got to be aware of is Nyquist's law. And for those who don't know, um, Nyquist's law can be sort of summarised with: you've got to be at least two times. You've got to sample. The particular frequency at at least two times the frequency that you're sampling at least two times the 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 um, uh, the, the 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 signal that you're actually sampling so if that signal is what two kilohertz the sample rate has to be uh, four kilohertz at least if not higher uh, to enable it to you to to get any intelligence out of it and be able to then recreate that so so yeah, decimation just enables you to, in a digital signal sense, um, reduce the load uh, and also uh, to somewhat simplify um, uh, some of the steps that the blocks have to take. So that's what decimation is all about. Um, um, so a good example, a good example actually is is in this one where um, you're at ninety six, um, uh, you're at ninety six. Um, uh, killer uh, samples per second at this point in time. Uh, you want to get down to um, to a audio sync sample rate of 48 kilohertz over here. So what you've got there's a decimation rate of two. So it's dividing it by two to get to your audio sync 48 kilohertz. So it just you you need to be aware of those sample rates all the way through and make sure that you're actually matching them or changing them or converting them on the way through. Um, now, okay, now I thought at this point in time everyone's probably getting totally and utterly sick of me giving them hints and tips about um, uh, RTL SDRs and all sorts of stuff, and you need to we need we need to actually be. Um, um, we need to actually do some real world amateur radio and RF stuff. <laughs> so I'll change back to here. So just to prove that the next bit that we're about to do is real, <laughs> we've got a um, RTL SDR, which is stock standard. It is it is the actual real RTL SDR.com uh, USB uh, dongle, um, and uh, it's just got a. a cute little antenna on it. Um, USB back to the computer and now what I've got to do here is uh, one of the things that you have to do with an RTL SDR if you haven't you haven't uh, played with these before is make sure that there is uh, the right driver on the PC uh, to actually drive this. So I came across in doing the um, uh, doing the, the the prep for this presentation, there is a wonderful, wonderful little freeware program, and I'll put the link in the um, in the video uh, the video stream. Ah, well, Richard, uh, very nice. If you've come by a Lime SDR, 
<laughs> think Lime SDR instead of RTL SDR and you can do exactly the same thing. Um, so uh, you can take uh, from the Lime SDR, uh, you can take the USB and also I think the Lime SDR also has an Ethernet uh, connector on it. So you can take a, a TCP or a UDP stream uh, if you're into networking, which uh, you, you, you are. You're, you're, uh, I suspect the reason you're on King Island is to do with networking. Hi, hi. Um, <laughs> um, so um, you can take a TCP or a UDP stream as a source uh, into, uh, into uh, GNU radio and then do some processing and have it come out the other side. So um, one of the things to, so you can ensure that your interface, uh, your driver interface for your RTL SDR or your Lime SDR or, or a range of other uh, SDRs, there is a wonderful little freeware program called Zadig, so Z-A-D-I-G, uh, that you install and you go up to options and say please list all my devices uh, which are connected to the USB uh, on your computer and there is a whole bunch of them here you can see uh, 2.4 gig keyboard, the mouse, um, there's a, a high definition HP True, blah blah blah, there's the wireless Bluetooth, there's all sorts of things hung off of here. The one you're looking for for the RTO SDR is the bulk in interface interface zero it does also sometimes come up with rtl sdr as well uh, on here now you notice uh, there's a driver in here and it's it is actually uh, pointing across here to the same driver so if there wasn't anything in here then the driver is not installed for this particular interface. So what you can do is go reinstall the driver and it goes ahead and reinstalls that driver and it'll appear. Okay, installing driver. And it's working away at it. Oh, okay, so USB three connector on uh, so okay but same, same story uh, Richard uh, it'll be via the USB port so uh, so you can you can certainly uh, we can come up with a GNU radio uh, driver for the Lime SDR via the USB you can do exactly what we're doing and <laughs> I probably shouldn't have clicked on that but anyway uh, it's just saying the installation program can take up to five minutes um, <laughs> so um, uh, oh Okay, yeah, uh, no. Ah, there we go. Now, the driver was installed successfully. Fantastic. So over here in this box, magically, there is the same uh, here, and we know that this is the RTL SDR up here, and the driver is installed. So you can now be confident that when you're starting to take a, uh, an RTL SDR source, which is this block here, and what we'll do is open this up, now there's a lot in this block, um, so we'll open it right up. So output type, um, you don't have to worry about that. The one thing you do have to worry about here is device arguments. We've got RTL equals zero. Now if we go back to Zadig, we'll notice it says interface zero. Now there are two USB interfaces, so there is a bulk interface, interface number one and zero. We're using zero in this particular case. So RTL equals zero in quotes up here. So that's the device argument that it actually uses to get to the RTL SDR through that driver. Um, forget about all of this, don't need to change any of this. The sample rate is set by up here, the variable which is sample rate which is set to 240K. Uh, so killer samples per second. Um, now, I happen to know, because I have calibrated this particular RTL SDR, and you can find this on the RTL SDR site, I know what the, the calibration parts per million is for this particular RTL SDR. So this is how stable the OCXO is in this particular uh, RTL SDR. I actually know it's 0 0.866 parts per million. So I can actually put that in. If you don't know that, it doesn't really matter, uh, but you can put in a frequency correction uh, figure in here, and it uses it. 
Now, RF gain, we've got a variable of RF gain because up here we have a control for the RF gain. Up here with one of those range controls. There is a set for IF gain, baseband gain, the antenna you don't have to worry about, and the channel bandwidth we've set to 100k kilohertz. Don't need to do anything in the advanced, uh, so at that stage we're all set for the RTL-SDR. Now, the output... Um, no, now, hang on. Huh. There is, though, one of the things we've got here is for frequency we've set up tuning. So we'll open up the tuning, the tuning range graphical user interface. The default value is 92.9 megahertz. So anyone who knows what that is, that's a, a commercial radio station. We start on the range of the low end of the FM broadcast band and the high end of the broadcast band for the stop, and we step in uh, 100 kilohertz steps. Uh, and I think that's all we need to do there. So that's set up to give us some frequency, some RF gain, and also some frequency um, uh, control of this RTL-SDR. The output of that goes into a block, which is an FM demodulation block. So, uh, channel rates the sample rate, which is 240K, takes it from the variable. Uh, audio decimation, so it, it automatically uh, checks that, the audio decimation rate. Uh, that's a variable that sits up here. Uh, so we can play with the, the, the deviation here. Uh, the, sorry, the audio decimation rate is set to the variable 5, sorry, <laughs> to the variable 5. Um, so we can play with that if we really want to. It's not set up as a range control. The deviation, again, the same thing. We can play with that by setting the deviation variable and then not have to, having to go into this block all the time. Uh, audio pass and audio stop, they're set at their defaults and the gain is set to 1. The output of this particular block goes through a multiply constant, and we saw that in the previous flow graph. What the multiply constant allows us to do is to um, vary the output of this FM demodulation block with through a range, and you can see the range here, and the ID is volume, because it's effectively a volume control into your audio sync or your sound card, so your speaker. So start at zero, stop at one, and we 0.05 uh, to in between. So we've got the ability to control the audio that stream that goes to your sound card. Now, what's it sound like? Let's run that, and you'll notice there are no um, no um, errors, there are no red boxes, no... There you go. Now, I've defaulted that to... Um, let's turn it up a bit. I've defaulted that to Triple J. So 92.9, and RF gain, we can play with the RF gain here, take it down, turn to zero, and signal drops out, go to noise, come back up again till we get full quietening, and volume and tuning. So if we go 90, Oh, down. I need to... 93.9, I think, is classic. In fact, what we need to do here, that tuning is a bit coarse. Let's go into the tuning block and make it... Instead of 100,000, let's make it 25 kilocycles. So we've just changed that. We... Recompile, you can see down here in the, the message block it's, it's going ahead and compiling all this into Python for us. There's a few little messages, interesting messages in here. PLL not locked, PLL not locked, and there's page size things and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's found, uh, and the real text, so the interface, uh, the actual uh, USB interface. Um, 92.9, okay. Now, let's go, we've got 
93. What's Classic FM? 93.9? No. 93.9. Well and truly. So, um, what I what I wanted to do in this demonstration is that's that is literally as easy as as it can be to get to to get something intelligible something intelligible out of an RTL SDR. Um, of course, th this is a pretty trivial example because it's it's basically an FM radio. However, it could be. Uh, you could set up a GNU radio uh, blocks into a WSJTX decoder uh, an encoder um, and you could uh, one of the ones I want to show um, a little bit later is um, to actually show this through a DVB-T demodulator so you can actually get vision and we can look at the RF signal that is actually uh, coming out of our our DATV transmitter uh, using the the RTL SDR because uh, it can it can decode uh, any modulation type you like so long as you know how to do it in um, in GNU Radio. So so that's um, I I just wanted to finish on a real world <laughs> example of using GNU Radio. Uh, using uh, one of the cheapest little receivers that you can you can probably buy on the market these days, uh, that is a pretty reasonable little uh, option to uh, experiment uh, with radio. Um, and there are many many examples of using the RTL SDR uh, for a whole range of different demodulations. Uh, there are some really complex ones out there, um, but uh, I just thought I'd finish on. On the note of, uh, he, here is a real world RTL SDR example of an FM radio, um, and and you have seen it here. It's actually up and going and working. Um, so uh, so that's something we can then build on, um, and it's uh, it, it it is yeah. It's it's. I, I just wanted to finish on a on an actual 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 uh, application using a uh, uh, something that uh, is known to uh, known and loved by uh, amateurs around the world, which is the RTL SDR. So, uh, what I, I, we'll finish on that note uh, with the uh, the GNU radio. And in fact, we're at eight twenty seven. So um, we'll just do a few reminders. Next week um, we will be doing more things uh, with the RTL SDR. Uh, we will certainly be doing a lot more things with the RTL SDR because uh, it's really convenient to bring in and uh, show you what we can actually do. Uh, and one of those, um, uh, certainly one of those uh, those experiments are going to be around DVB-T uh, and uh, the the digital television, amateur digital television, uh, using the RTL SDR, and then using also um, the. Uh, the GNU radio to produce a transmitter, uh, a, a DVB-T uh, transmitter, which uh, I just it blows me away that you can actually do that with a uh, with a piece of freewell software uh, that's available multi-platform. So, uh, so there you go. Um, that is uh, GNU Radio Companion. Uh, that is our fourth. I think it's our fourth. Um, yeah, workshop number four. So uh, workshop number four, and that is coming from uh, the RTL SDR is not in this book. Uh, I, I, I diverge from the workshops there a little bit, but um, the rest of the material that I'm actually uh, presenting is actually from that uh, that particular workshop manual. So there you go. Let me move across here, and we'll finish off uh, with um, now our. Um, July uh, presentation night for the Radio and Electronics Association is a presentation and also a tour, so a presentation of the the Tasmania wide network uh, that Tas Maritime Radio, which is the group uh, that we share this site with, 
Um, they, uh, they cover the uh, maritime emergency frequencies around Tasmania, so they actually cover the whole of Tasmania. Uh, so they've got a pretty extensive uh, networked uh, radio system, both on VHF and HF. Uh, they're going to give us a presentation and then we're going to be able to uh, tour the uh, operations room and also the little museum that they've got set up next door. Now, the key thing here is it is not on the first Wednesday of the night of the month. It is on the second Wednesday of the month, which is July the 14th. So July the 7th will be a standard DATV night, and then July the 14th will be the presentation night with Taz Maritime Radio. Our August uh, presentation night, which will be on the first, uh, which is the 4th of August, first Wednesday night, uh, is contesting with uh, Martin VK7GN on HF and also, pardon, um, also Richard VK7 who is on the, the chat, thank you Richard, and I have had a sneak preview of his uh, presentation that he's putting together, so uh, very impressive and quite humorous. Uh, will be giving us a talk on uh, VHF and above uh, and microwave um, contesting. So that's in preparation for the 14th and 15th of August, which is the Remembrance Day contest. And then our September presentation night, uh, getting way ahead, which is the 1st of September, Wednesday the 1st of September, is uh, the TAS Government Radio Network with Andrew uh, Johns, VK7AJ. So uh, there you go. Now, um, our videos tonight, uh, for those who missed last week's, uh, we're going to do a, a reprise of satellites and antennas and a demonstration um, with, uh, with uh, Mike, VK7DMH, for, so for those who missed it. We also um, like to send a shout out to Alan, VK7KAJ, who's uh, hauled up uh, in lockdown in Melbourne. Um, uh, I promise uh, he... <laughs> He sent through a video um, which was, I promise this story is about microwaves. Uh, I promise this story about is about micro. I promise this story about microwaves is interesting. Let me get that right. So, um, and it's about defrosting hamsters, uh, which is absolutely fascinating and uh, industrial use for microwaves. So uh, that's a bit of an interesting little video that one. Uh, we've got a Vertassium, uh, so the guy from Vertassium back again, risking my life to settle a physics debate, which is a fascinating little um, little video about going faster than the wind that is pushing you along in a device, uh, in a very Heath Robinson device that he risks his uh, risks his life with. So, uh, um, oh, hello, uh, Harry VK Seven HXT. Uh, like, like, love you like the hat. That's good. Uh, so that's our that's our videos for our RF viewers tonight. So that's probably all we're going to get to. Anyway, well, um, uh, if there is any questions or anything, shoot them through uh, on R two or the uh, the chat channel. But we'll head across to our videos and we'll head out for a uh, a cup of tea in the uh, in the club rooms. This is VK Seven OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania, with our DATV Experimenters Night, and uh, we will bid you seventy three. We'll see you next week for our next instalment uh, with a focus on RTL SDRs and GNU Radio Companions. So seventy three and. Uh, uh, wish everybody a, uh, a happy long weekend this weekend for the uh, Queen's birthday and thank you to the uh, Queen's birthday the Queen for uh, having a birthday in uh, in June in the middle of winter <laughs> so uh, there you go and everybody can go off and uh, enjoy uh, dark mofo and uh, all of that sort of stuff so anyway 73 to all on frequency and we'll uh, catch you next time cheers